We're in Psalm 23 tonight. So remember, we, we're looking at Psalm 22, 23, 24, in a, and really as a unit, we believe that these were placed here uh, in order for a reason. These are Psalms of David. Last week in Psalm 22, we talked about uh, the, the lengthy uh, title that's put on it. Psalm 23 uh, just simply says a Psalm of David. Uh, Miss Moore la David, the, the, a Psalm of David. <clears throat> so Psalm 22, or if we you think about the theme of, of shepherd, Jesus is called a shepherd three places and in three ways in the New Testament. So Jesus calls himself in John 10, I'm the good shepherd. Uh, in uh, Hebrews, uh, Jesus is the great shepherd, great shepherd of the sheep in Hebrews 13, 20. In 1 Peter 5, 4, he's the chief shepherd. Peter writes to the, to the elders and reminds them that Jesus is the, the chief shepherd. So if you think of these three Psalms, Psalm 22 about the death of Jesus. This is the good shepherd laying down his life for his sheep. Next week, we'll look at Psalm 24. That's the chief shepherd returning for his sheep. But tonight, we're going to look at Psalm 23, which is the great shepherd uh, who is leading his sheep. There's a danger anytime you're studying a passage of scripture that you know well. Uh, it's, you, you know, you've heard this. This is, this might be the most famous passage in the Bible. People who aren't even Christians have heard, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You see it in movies when there's a graveside scene or something. We, we see it on plaques and uh, Britain. It, it is very literally pastoral. It's a, a poem about a shepherd and sheep, which is what the word pastoral means. And so we're really well acquainted with it. But there's so much here that we want, we want to take a look at. So I'm going to read it. Uh, every translation owes a lot. Every English translation owes a lot to the King James Version. They try and get the diction of the King James Version. They, frankly, English translators, when they get to the 23rd Psalm, they mess with it as little as they can just because it's already in people's minds so strongly. So let's read this together. I'm beginning in, in verse one. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, it's just six verses. And yet, man, it's so much there. And it has influenced and affected, really, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and even world culture. Think of the psalm as in two parts. Verses 1 through 4 is the Lord, my, my shepherd, Changes verses five and six are not pastoral. I mean, it's not an image. It's not a, you know, a, a sheep doesn't sit at a table. So the image changes. The metaphor changes in five and six to the Lord, my host. It's like he he has he's hosting me for a meal. So uh, the the Lord is portrayed in the first part as the shepherd. <clears throat> that shouldn't surprise us. Uh, 
In fact, you see in the Old Testament several places where the Lord is the shepherd of his people. Uh, Psalm 78, uh, verse 52. You want to turn over there and take a look at that Psalm, one of the better known ones, Psalm 78. Uh, And verse 52, this is uh, about the, this is a psalm of Asaph and it's about the Exodus, uh, how God struck down the firstborn in, in Egypt. And then verse 52, then he led out his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Turn over a page probably in Psalm 80, verse one, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, remember, if you're in my Isaiah class, you would know that Isaiah 40 begins the second half of that book, sort of the New Testament portion of the book, and it's the comfort portion. And right there in Isaiah 40 and in uh, verse 11, God is portrayed as the shepherd <coughs> of his people. But here, the metaphor is made unmistakably personal. Think about it. Hear the difference. Psalm 78, the Lord led his people like a flock. The, the, hear, O shepherd of Israel, uh, the, the, you who led Joseph. But now, hear the difference. The Lord is my shepherd. This is unique. Uh, more often than not, in the Old Testament, God is portrayed as the God of his people collectively. Uh, and you will hear, O oh Lord, our God. It's rare that God is addressed personally and individually in the Old Testament. It's not, this isn't the only place, but it doesn't happen nearly as much. This is why one, one reason why when Jesus shows up in, uh, when he's born or when he, and during his earthly ministry, and he calls God my father. Uh, he prays uh, to God personally. He calls out to God individually. He doesn't speak collectively, but my father, uh, my God. It's, that would have been <coughs> jarring to the Pharisees. They would not have addressed God individually. But here in Psalm 23, you have this very personal, the Lord is my shepherd. And the Christian surely sees Jesus in this because in the New Testament, Jesus, uh, he calls himself, I am the good shepherd. Now, all these places we looked at here uh, speak of God, Yahweh, as the shepherd of Israel. And Jesus, when he says, I am the good shepherd, He's making a bold, audacious claim. He is the shepherd of Psalm 23. He is the shepherd of Psalm 78, of Psalm 80, of Isaiah 40. Jesus puts that on himself. Uh, I am the good shepherd. And so uh, this is how we read Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. The good shepherd laying down his life for his sheep, the chief shepherd leading his sheep, the great shepherd returning for his sheep. Jesus applies this metaphor to himself. Now, when we look at verse one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. These, we, we, we've said that hundreds, maybe thousands of times in our lives, but think how they go together. If you can say the Lord is my shepherd, then you must say, I shall not want, right? If he's really your shepherd, you'll never want for anything. Your shepherd will not deny you any good thing. I was asked a question last week. Somebody asked me, they said, okay, if you could go back and like change any decisions you made in your life, like what would you change? Now, I'm not talking about sin. There's a lot of sin that I wish I hadn't done, but uh, just as far as decisions at junctures in your life, 
And my answer is, well, if I changed anything, I'd mess it up. This is, this is where God led me and along every step. Uh, the, the one decision I, look, I go back to and now as a professor at Southern Seminary, I think back to the time, you know, Brother Range, my pastor in Lexington, offered to keep me on full salary and if I would go to Southern, I could still live in Lexington and just be there on the weekends. And there's a part of me that wishes I had said yes because then I would have met Al Moeller when he was in seminary and uh, Tom Rayner and, and Mark Dever. And there, there were guys there that I had no idea that there were any conservative students there. And I just said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to mid-America where they believe the Bible and I'd just be in a fight all the time at Southern. Now there's a part of me humanly looks back at that and I thought, man, what, what, if, what if I'd done that? But here's the reality. Uh, I'd have messed it up. The Lord in his providence led me exactly where I needed to go. And when we really have Christ as our shepherd, then we can't ever say that, well, I, I wish I'd had this or I wish this had happened to me. No, God used exactly where you went to shape you and make you who you are for his glory. If, you know, Jesus said, if you being evil, boy, what an assumption Jesus makes about us, by the way. If you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more does your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What does James say? Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights with who there is no, no variableness or shadow of turning. So God has led you. If indeed you are his sheep, he's your shepherd, then you don't want. Now let's be honest and admit that our feelings are very different than that. Our feelings are something else. But the more you walk with this shepherd, the more this shepherd leads you, the more you realize how well he's cared for you, the more you learn to no longer have fear and anxiety. Are you, maybe, are you, you ever afraid of thunder, lightning, the storm? You ever feel that? Spurgeon talked about how much he loved the voice of his father in the thunder. You remember when, G, when God spoke from heaven one time and he said, this is my son. And it said that the people hearing that thought that it was thunder. And Spurgeon was referring to that. I think it's that John 12. And uh, God, uh, he was referring to that when he said to hear the voice of his father in thunder. And he talked about just seeing God riding the storm. The psalmist talks about that. The, you know, the things that we often fear that cause us anxiety are really the things that show us the presence of God. And it, it, is, a, it is a fearful thing to get older. It's a fearful thing to have a, disease, a, a diagnosis of cancer. I mean, these are things that cause anxiety and fear. And yet we trust that our shepherd leads us. He leads us. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I shall not want. I have everything that I need. This is the promise of 2 Peter chapter 1, that we have everything we need for life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. The more we know Christ, the more we know our shepherd, the more we realize the way he's caring for us, providing for us, and leading us. And so how does he lead us, this God, this shepherd, uh, who makes sure that we do not want? Well, look at verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Why would a shepherd make sheep lie down in green pastures? What is what do they get? So if you've ever been over there in 
the southern part of, of uh, Israel in those hills of Judea where David grew up, it is barren, especially during the dry season. And there's just, there's not a lot of growth. And to find one place that maybe uh, is sheltered from the sun where the vegetation still lives even during the dry season. So a shepherd has to find those places where his sheep can go. Now you think about sheep. Uh, man, when you look at the food chain, where are sheep on the food chain? Of what are sheep predators? They are, they're not predators of anything. So they're pretty much at the bottom of the animal food chain. There's, there's no animal sheep are eating, but there are a lot of animals that eat sheep. And they have no defense system. There, there's, I mean, a sheep just, they're dumb. They're easy prey. Uh, and so, and they don't, they don't know how to find pasture. They, they don't know how to find water. The shepherd has to lead them, especially in that dry, arid part of the world where David grew up and it's all hilly and rocky. You know, it's not sandy desert there. It's rocky desert and very little vegetation. So for a shepherd to know where there's a green pasture, first of all, to even get the sheep to the green pasture is going to wear them out. It's going to tire them. So he makes them lie down. They might want to keep walking on, but he makes them lie down in green pasture. So that implies, first of all, rest. And secondly, food. Jesus is both our rest and our nourishment. How does Jesus describes this. He says, uh, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I like that word rest, don't you? That's a good word. You know, it's a mark of maturity that you learn to rest and to enjoy rest. It's a sign of immaturity, childishness, if you will. Very few children uh, who are like eight years old and you say, hey, it's nap time. They go, oh, great, goody, goody, goody. I get to take a nap. They don't do that. Oh, they don't want to take a nap. They want to stay up. Uh, was it F FOMO, fear of missing out? You know, they, they're afraid they're going to miss something. Hey, tell me to take a nap. I'm going to jump up and down for joy. You tell me I get to take a nap. I love to take a nap. If I ever get the chance, I like doing it. Why? Well, I've, I've gotten old enough to realize I need rest and that it's a precious thing, that it, uh, it's, a, it's a joyful thing. Immaturity says, no, Lord, I don't want to rest. When the, Remember I used this illustration a few weeks ago about teaching Seth to drive. And if I said to him, now, Seth, put your, uh, first thing I want you to do, put your foot on that brake. And he said, no, I'm really not interested in the brake. I want to put my foot on the accelerator. Well, if he's not interested in the brake, he's not ready to drive. And if you're not willing to let the Lord lead you to lie down, lead you into rest, you're really not ready to follow the Lord anywhere. He knows when to make you rest. He knows when to not let you have the journey you want and to go where you want to go. There have been times in my life that I coveted after a position or an honor or something and God said no and he shut the door. And I felt disappointment. But, you know, looking back at it now, I say, boy, God was so good. I did not realize then what he was protecting me from. I didn't realize what he was saving me for. I didn't get why he was making me rest. But now I see that when I thought he was holding me back and not letting me fulfill my potential, he was just resting me and getting me prepared for the rest of the journey. To, to rest in Jesus is also to feed on Christ. Jesus said, remember, this is one of his hard sayings. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't see the kingdom of God. 
well, man, that, who is this guy talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood? Well, Jesus is saying how we feed on him. He who gives us rest also gives us sustenance. That's what it is to lie down in green pastures. That in the rest from our own labors that cannot save us, to feed on Christ who is all sufficient for our need, uh, this is how he leads us. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I was in uh, Israel one time uh, back in the 90s, and I saw a guy w walking down a road. Well, I, we were on the bus, and I saw this guy walking down this road, and he had two big long sticks, and he was herding these sheep. He was behind them, and he would, he would haul hut hut and, and sort of get around this way, get around this way, driving the sheep down the road, trying to keep them on the road. And I'd never seen that before. I'd seen shepherds out in the field with their sheep, and they were never driving them. They'd be walking along. Sheep would be walking along behind them. I'd never seen this. And I said to Zvi, I said, look at that guy. I, I've never seen a shepherd driving his sheep. He said, oh, that's not a shepherd. That's a butcher. He's bought the sheep, and they won't follow him. They don't know him. So he has to drive them to the slaughterhouse. Well, there's my sermon illustration for life. Uh, a lot of pastors need to learn that. A lot of pastors trying to drive people. I've learned a long time ago, sometimes you can lead Baptists. You can never force them. Uh, you know, so you better try and lead them, but you sure can't drive them because they're just not going to play that game. And you know, that's what Jesus does. Look, look how gentle Jesus is with the disciples. Well, they say stupid things and, and they don't get it. He keeps telling them over and over. You know, Peter gives that speech. Oh, no, that'll, I'll never let that happen to you, Jesus. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus is always leading them. He's, he's not driving them. Even when Peter betrays Jesus and, and Jesus just looks at him, he doesn't say anything. The next time Jesus speaks to Peter is after the resurrection. They're at Galilee, and what's Jesus doing? He's, he's restoring him. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. So he leads us. He doesn't drive us. He's a gentle shepherd. He's a good shepherd who leads his people. We follow him. We're not driven by, you know, I mean, God could make any of us do anything and yet he's so patient and he's so gentle and he's so kind and he's so forgiving and he makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. Sheep can't swim. When I was a boy growing up in Christian County, we had a problem for a while with wild dogs and farmers would pay bounty to boys like me to shoot wild dogs because they were, were, they were being predatory and killing animals. And the man that was a member of my dad's church had 100 sheep in a field. And in the corner of that field was a pond. And one night, a pack of wild dogs got in there and killed 99 of the sheep not by eating them, but by running them into that pond. And those sheep got in that pond and their wool got soaked and they just drowned. A strange memory from my childhood is gigging for frogs in that pond with all those dead sheep in it. I actually did that. It was weird and it didn't smell good, uh, but we did it. So. I don't know why I told you that, but it's just a <laughs> memory that just went by, came out of nowhere. There it is, gigging for frogs and shining the light on dead sheep. But yeah, the, the dogs didn't eat them. They just, they just ran them into the pond. Uh, the, the sheep in panic and terror to get away from the dogs ran into the pond, got their wool full of water, and they drowned. And uh, if, if a 
shepherd leads sheep to rapid water, running water, the sheep either can't drink it because they're terrified of it, or if they do get in it, they drown. So he has to lead them to still waters. And just think about the forethought of the shepherd in choosing the place to take them and where to water them. Uh, and of course, David, David's favorite place was a, a spring in the desert called En Gedi. And David would go there when he was on the run from Saul. I, I, en Gedi is a beautiful place in the middle of the desert, water coming out of a rock. And the pool of water that comes down below that fall is so still. And there are uh, ibex there and these animals that are around there, they come to drink at En Gedi. And so I can picture David, even as a boy, bringing his sheep there to En Gedi, in the middle of that desert, the Dead Sea down there below, which you can't drink, and here a pool of clear, crystal, refreshing water. And David, as he writes this psalm, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is, he realizes that's what God has done for him. That as a boy, as he led the sheep, God was leading him. It's really something that God took a shepherd and made him the great king of Israel. And of course, what a picture of Jesus. Jesus is our shepherd. And this imagery that God puts into the Old Testament, which then is fulfilled in Christ in the New. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restores my soul. Now, I love this phrase because what a picture it is. You know, because of sin, we're born with our, our, we're still bearers of the image of God, but that image is defaced. So our souls bear the marks of sin. But when Jesus is our shepherd, what does he do? He restores our souls. The souls that are twisted and disfigured by the sin of others against us. I, uh, the other night, well, I don't know, was that last night or the night before? I can't remember, Monday night or Tuesday night, I did an event at the University of Louisville with Rachel Den Hollander. I gotta bring her here to buck around sometime. If you don't recall, Rachel Den Hollander was the, the, the woman who uh, first publicly spoke out against Larry Nasser, that United States Gymnastics Association doctor. And the, when they had the sentencing phase of, of uh, it really wasn't a trial because he pled guilty, but part of the plea, plea bargain was that he had to sit there and every, uh, every victim that wanted to speak during the sentencing phase could speak. And there were like, I want to say 250, something like that. It was over 200 women that spoke and told what he, how he had abused them. And the judge let Rachel go last uh, because she had been the first to go public with it and contacted Indianapolis uh, a, a newspaper when they were doing a, a series. And the other night, she's really very gospel-centered, and I would just ask her questions, and then she would, she would go to the gospel and just talk about the difference in justice and love and, and how God can be both loving and just and tremendous. And uh, when I, I think about what happened to her and those women, and this has become so much a part of our public conversation recently. We see so many victims that come for, forward and talking about things that were done to them by famous people, by rich people, powerful people. Uh, people that should be trustworthy. It's in churches. It's in the Catholic church. It's in evangelical churches, Baptist churches. It's in Hollywood. Sin is everywhere. And there are people that are scarred. Their souls are scarred by the sins of others. But we all have to admit that our souls are scarred because of what we've done to others. Our souls are scarred and twisted because of the sin we've committed. And we're in a fallen world. And we're born with our 
souls disfigured because of sin. But the Lord Jesus restores our souls. He, he refreshes us and he gives us a new lease on life. Uh, and the next verse says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, Sunday we're going to talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, this, this is an incredible thing. God is righteous. He's holy. He does not lead us astray. James tells us that God is, since God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man, he always leads us in paths of righteousness. How did Jesus teach us to pray? That God would do what he said, lead us not into temptation. Lead us in paths of righteousness. This is our desire. This is our 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 heart that we want to follow our shepherd and Jesus is always going to lead us in paths of righteousness. Why? Because it's for his name's sake. It's for his glory. If, if he were to mislead us, then the stain would be on his reputation. When Jesus became our shepherd, he gave us a promise that he was going to care for us and he was never going to forsake us and he was never going to lead us. Uh, astray, and so when he leads us in paths of righteousness, it's for his namesake. You have to understand that everything that is his for his glory is also for your good. These two things are never in competition. God will always do what is for his glory, and it is for your good. All things work together for good to those who love God. You who are his sheep, beloved of God, lovers of God, never have to worry. He's going to mislead you. He, his word is like a, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our paths. It illumines for us how he wants us to live, how he wants us to love, how he wants us to go. He's leading us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But then... Uh, there's a shadow that falls over the path. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. A lot of people are anxious about death. We're anxious about the death of others, people we love, probably more than we're anxious about our own deaths. We have to remember the promise of God that for the believer, death can hurt you. No, the shadow of a thief can't pick your pocket. The shadow of a truck can't crash into your car. The great Donald Gray Barnhouse, Presbyterian preacher, uh, tell, told the story how his wife died when his children were small. Now, you've probably never heard Donald Gray Barnhouse preach, but you're about to hear the best imitation of Donald Gray Barnhouse you've ever heard. That I'm pretty well assure you of. Uh, but here's, here's the way he told it. He said, I remember when my wife died. On the way to the funeral, I, we saw the largest truck we had ever seen. And I said to my children, children, would you rather be hit by that truck or by its shadow? And they said, why, Father, you're being silly. Of course, we'd rather be hit by its shadow. And I said, well, that's all that's happened to your mother. Death has not touched her, only its shadow. We have to remember that, that it's the shadow of death for us. Tanya was talking to Laura Garner yesterday. Laura's mother died and Tanya was consoling her and Laura, you know, watching her mother die in those final weeks. Tanya said, think about what it was like when she first entered heaven. Can you imagine to be free from that bed and from that body? to be in the presence of Jesus. I mean, 
you think about this, the, I mean, the overwhelming ecstasy of being in the presence of God, really at any time, but especially after you, you see me, how I came in so excited, my knee doesn't hurt. I could, it, the pain of it's still so fresh in my mind that today, I mean, just feeling like this is, oh, my knee, and that's just my knee. Can you imagine to go through cancer, to go through uh, the, the dementia, and suddenly to wake up in the presence of Jesus with a clear mind? And the first thing you see is the glory of God, the Savior who led you so faithfully and brought you there to be with him for eternity just like he promised. It's not death that has touched you. It's just a shadow of death. Jesus faced death for us. Jesus took death on himself for us. We just walk through the valley of its shadow. And the, the hills around us might cast a shadow of death. And it's not clear like out in the sunlight. We're might, we might be afraid to walk into that shadow, but it's just a shadow of death. It, it can't harm you. It can only make you just leave that earthly body behind, but you are who you are and you're in the presence of Christ and you have not only the memory of what he's done, but the reality of who he is right there before you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Uh, so there's this new car wash up here, Freddy's. And they got this neat thing, you know, you pay, you know, one, one price and you just go through it as many times as you want during the month. Well, my car is always getting, if, I, if you drive to West Kentucky, you get so many bugs on your car. So I got this deal at Freddy's where I can run through, you know, I pay whatever it is for, for a month and I, I can go through it as many times. And I love going through there with my grandkids. And it's just fun, you know, and it gets dark and it's, it's noisy and stuff. So I took Harper through it for the first time the other day. And she'd never been through it. And she was sitting in the back seat in her car seat. And, you know, suddenly that, that foam comes down and, and it's all over the car. And you can't see out. And the car's moving. And then those brushes start beating it. And it's making all this noise. And I see Harper is looking around. And she's not sure what to make of it. And then she looked at me. And she saw me smiling. And she smiled. I, I said, isn't this fun? She goes, yeah. <laughs> what changed? When she took her eyes off of that and looked at me and she saw I wasn't worried. She's with Papa and Papa's not worried. This is fun. You know, when we we're going through the valley of the shadow of death, it's not arrogance or pride that makes us not afraid. It's the presence of Christ. We say, oh, I've never been here before. This looks scary. But I'm looking at Jesus, and he's already faced death, and he's come out the other side victorious, and he's seated at the right hand of God, and he's not worried. I'm okay. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. A shepherd has a, a, a staff, usually had a, a crook on the end of it. So, now again, that's a very craggy, rocky, hilly place where David would have tended sheep. There are cliffs, what, what they call wadis. You can be walking along, you're up on the top, and suddenly there's a deep ravine where they have flash flooding that just cuts through the desert. Sheep may not be paying attention and just can fall to their deaths. A shepherd would take that crook and put it around their neck and yank them back. Sometimes if a sheep kept straying off the path, he might tap it. He hit it a little bit, get its attention. Even if a sheep is, continues to stray and put itself in danger of going out there where there are predators, a shepherd would break a leg and then splint it so that 
the pain of that broken leg would keep the sheep from straying. You say, well, that's cruel. Well, uh, it's not as cruel as letting it get eaten by a predator. Sometimes the Lord chastises us. We, f we feel like, you know, I mean, uh, you know, somebody, a preacher might tell you, God will never hurt you, but sometimes it feels like he's killing you. He's brought such chastisement into your life. He's breaking your leg to keep you from strain. And you think, man, why, God, why are you hurting me like this? Why are you letting this pain in my life? Again, you don't know what he's protecting you from. You don't know what he's teaching you, how he's shaping you to be like Jesus. But God uses his rod and his staff. And even his discipline is a comfort. This is what Proverbs says, the book of Hebrews says, that no chastisement of the Lord for the present time seems joyful. You don't like it when it's happening, but God disciplines every son or daughter whom he loves. And if, if God lets you do anything you want, that's because as Hebrew says, you're a bastard, not a child. But if you're his, he, he, he cares for you. And part of that care is discipline. His rod and his staff are not there to hurt you, but to protect you. That should be a comfort to us. And, uh, and then he says that you, now, now he, the scene changes. All right, now in verses five and six, he's not our shepherd, he's our host. And, the, and so he, the, the scene here is, is that out in this wilderness, he's prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Now, I want, that's an odd image, isn't it? What do you mean you prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies? Uh, in David's world, there in those wadis and ravines and hills, and da David had been on the run from Saul for years. Saul's army had been after David. They used arrows and spears and slings. The last thing you could do was go out into the open. You didn't go out into the clearing. Uh, you stayed up in the caves. Remember at one point, David was hiding out in a cave called Adullam. And it said that all who were, were uh, discontented, all those that were oppressed came and gathered to David and made him their, their captain over them. What an image, David, the the captain of the discontented, but that's another sermon. The point is they were hiding out in a cave. I think it says 600 people were with David in the cave of Adullam hiding from Saul. Now look at this image. They're out in the open. They're not just out in the open where the enemies can see them. They're out there in the open where the enemies do see them. And yet there's no fear. The, the host of this meal is so in control that he can have a table prepared in the presence of your enemies and you don't have to worry about it. He's protecting you. He's sparing you. He's saving you. And your enemies cannot hurt you. God puts you on display because he's made himself uh, the one who cares for you. He's obligated himself to protect you. And so he puts us on display. Uh, in the presence of our enemies, he uh, anoints my head with oil. Now, that might seem an odd thing to us because we don't live in a culture that does that. But in the, there in the ancient Near East, in the heat of the sun, they would put oil on it. It, it, gave, it had a cooling effect. And it, it just, and it protected you from the elements, the wind, the sun. It was refreshing. The Bible talks about uh, the oil running down in Aaron's beard. And this is always a, a beautiful picture. In fact, what is the, what does the word Messiah mean? The anointed one. The word in Greek, Christos, Christ is the anointed one. So the anointing. Is a, a picture of God's designation 
of his own, of his Messiah, here of his people. You anoint my head with oil. You have anointed me. You've declared me to be yours. You're, you've protected me from my enemies, from the elements, and you've anointed my head with oil, so I don't need to worry about the, you know, Psalm 120 says, the sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. Uh, God has so put his protection on me. And I think this is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the spirit that we have. The, the word is chrisma in the New Testament. And this is the way God preserves and protects us by the anointing of his Holy Spirit. My cup overflows and is... You know, in a dry, arid region, region you got to watch your, your water. You don't want to run out of water. David says, man, I'm not about, I'm not to run out. My cup's overflowing. It's, it's full and overflowing. This is the way Christians live. We don't, we don't live in the penury and poverty of a desperate people that are, we're hoping God takes care of us. We live in the abundance and the overflow of his provision for us in Christ. You, you ever feel guilt? You ever feel oppressed by the memory of your own sin? Here's the good news. The blood of Christ is greater than your sin. You think your cup of iniquity overflows? I got news for you. It doesn't nearly overflow like the blood of Jesus that cleanses you. You have the righteousness of Christ. And when your conscience smites you and you feel the guilt of past sin, look to Jesus and the greatness of his sacrifice that is greater than your sin. Your cup overflows. You don't have to hope that the sacrifice Jesus made is good enough or great enough. You can know that he has applied his blood for your sin and it's greater. My cup overflows. Man, the cup of blessing. What have you needed that you have not had? Can you not look back over your life and just see God's provision and protection for you? He brought the people into your life that you needed there. He's brought the moments that you had to turn to him there to make you see him. Your cup should overflow. And now he looks to eternity. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now think about this. We've seen, it's like the shepherd in life. We saw this mar marvelous spiritual relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. We saw the shepherd in death. David leading us, as it were, through the tomb with the assurance of the Lord's presence and the Lord's protection. But now he's led us to the table and he's shown us really the shepherd in eternity. That he is our shepherd and he's leading us to a destination. It's his presence. He is our host who prepares us this banquet in eternity. How does the book of Revelation end? It ends with a meal. A marriage supper, an invitation to anyone who will to come. And look at this great description. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we know how the story is going to end. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to fear it. Our story ends in the presence of Christ Goodness, mercy, follow us right into heaven where Jesus does for us exactly what he promised all along he would do. Is not this a marvelous little song? I mean, can you imagine six verses that speak greater comfort to our hearts than this? Let's take a moment and just praise the Lord for his goodness. Father, I can't, my heart is just full thinking about what you have provided for us. I can't express the gratitude sufficient for the overflowing cup of your grace, forgiveness, mercy, and love. 
and to think about those that we have loved who are now, we know, in your presence and you have kept your word to them and to think that one day gathered with them before you, dwelling in your house forever, our hearts overflow with the knowledge that you are a faithful shepherd and you will lead us through death's shadow and into the light of your house forever. How we thank you that we need not fear because Jesus has taken the sting out of death and that he is faithful. May we live as faithful sheep following closely to you in gratitude for your goodness and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.